What's up everybody? Coming to you today with another episode of Police Encounters. Now the first part of this is going to talk about lawful arrest and searches because again we understand that's a fourth amendment issue and a lot of times I've also spoken about them giving you half of a statute or half of an ordinance or half of a law now here is where we come into where they are allowed searches without having obtaining a search warrant let's go through them because there's only six exceptions and then the next video I'm gonna go into exigent circumstances one the search incident to lawful arrest understand pretty much they have probable cause to be there you are or the person that's involved is the one that fits that description or the one they witnessed doing that they have something from a judge all that good stuff a search incident to lawful arrest does not require issuance of a warrant if the person is lawfully arrested the police may search his or her person and any area surrounding that person within arms reach the rationale from this is a protective measure for police safety and to secure evidence that may be destroyed. Chimel v. California, 395 U.S. 752, 1969. Now again, you often hear that, oh, this is for police safety. Remember, you either have to be arrested or they have to believe that you have a weapon on you and they can point to where that weapon is. They don't have to know what type of weapon it is. They have to know or believe that a weapon is on you or you have to be under arrest for lawfully. And that is the big key because a lot of times they will arrest you or they will detain you and call it an arrest without charges. And prior to charging you with a crime, they'll say, oh, well, this is for police officer safety. They have to believe that you are in possession of a weapon or the search itself has to be consensual if you do not consent it is unlawful if you're not arrested lawfully it is unlawful there again anything that violates your constitutional protected instructions for them is a violation which means that they are open and they are liable for a suit now we're going to go on because i don't want to spend a whole lot of time on that portion of it the next part of that is a search incident to a lawful arrest also applies to the search of a vehicle specifically when officers arrest the occupants of that vehicle now again has to be lawful and a lot of times it is not in Arizona v Grant 556 US 332 2009 the Supreme Court held that an officer may search a vehicle if the officer has a reasonable belief that the vehicle harbors weapons accessible to the arrestee a continuing threat to the officer's safety again he has to believe that there is a weapon within arms reach and or if the officer believes the evidence is harbored within the vehicle concerning the crime of the arrest so if he's arresting you for jaywalking or if he's arresting you for let's say a traffic infraction there is no search that's allowed unless he believes that you have a weapon to harm him. If he does not believe that you have a weapon or they remove you from the area of your vehicle, they no longer can use the words safety because they are now removed you from the area which they believe is dangerous. And if you're arrested for a traffic infraction, there is no crime, so there is no search for because of the crime for arrest because there is no crime so the search then has to be consensual if not it is a violation and they will try to eke around this at any possible moment why because most people have no idea what that is or they have to go to a public defender who does not care or have time to go through this so that's why you have to know and you have to be able to give instructions because again they expect you to be competent if you don't know this you have to pay for it. The next exception, exception number two, is the plain view exception. I'm going to get deeper in this in the next couple videos simply because the understanding of plain view 
is somewhat confusing. Exception number two is the plain view doctrine. And the plain view doctrine allows the officer to seize without a warrant evidence and contraband that are found in plain view during a lawful observation. Again, the wording that is used is why I started the series the way I did. Because you have to understand what lawful is. Because it's going to be used a lot as you go along. Because they can say, oh, this is lawful. What makes it lawful? And 90% of them will say, my badge, because I'm an officer. No, that does not make it lawful. Because if you are a law enforcement officer, you must be able to articulate what makes anything that you're doing lawful. So now, the thing that we're going to go into now is Horton v. California, 496 U.S. 128 1990. The court eliminated the requirement that the discovery of evidence in plain view be inadvertent, which has led to difficulties defining inadvertent discovery. Inadvertent discovery is also something when we go into dealing with them in court that I'm going to go further into because inadvertent discovery is also an end around finding evidence. The rules to the plain view doctrine are simple because there's only three of them. The first one, the officer to be lawfully present at the place where the evidence can be plainly viewed. So a traffic infraction is not a lawful place for them to be unless you are participating in a privilege or you are involved in commercial activity. Again, as for a later date but understanding the first part of that because there are three requirements that's just one the officer to have a lawful right to access to the object if your car or vehicle or conveyance is locked and they can see something on the seat they have to get a warrant because they don't have access to the object if they've broken a window they have violated because they don't have access and there is this thing called exigent circumstances. There is no threat to them. There is no threat of loss. So again, the officer must have a lawful reason to be present. They must have access. The third reason, the incriminating character of the object to be immediately apparent. So basically, they have to have a lawful reason to be there. They have to have access. And that has that object that they're looking at has to be part of a crime if it is not it is completely unlawful and that is Horton v California 496 US 128 1990 for the plain view doctrine not to go too far off of subject but I want to add in two more cases really quick because one of the things they like to do is if you are in the car with your mate or a potential mate or girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever have you, what they like to do is separate the two of you. Both of you have quote unquote equal ownership in the object or the conveyance. One of the things that they will do is if you deny them, they'll ask your mate. And the mate was like, hell, there's nothing in there. Go ahead and search it. Here's where that becomes unlawful. Georgia v. Randolph, 547 U.S. 103, 2006, is a case in which the United States Supreme Court held that without a search warrant, police had no constitutional right to search a home where one resident consents to the search while the other resident objects. Now, the principles of this case is exactly what we're speaking of, because just like we use the plain view doctrine, it works in the exact same way because they have to have a re lawful reason to be there and if they're there for you they also have to have your consent they cannot get consent from another person just because they're there unless that other person is also charged with the act the court distinguished that case Georgia v Randolph from United States v Matlock 415 US 
164-1974, which permitted one resident to consent in absence of a co-occupant. So in, in the most part of it, it took them to a little more than 20 years to correct, or 30 years, excuse me, to correct something which police still use 11 years later or even 12 years later in some cases because this case Georgia v. Randolph started back in 2005 so understanding that if you are the one that's being charged you are the one that's being questioned and you are the one that's not consenting you are the one that has the ultimate standing that that allows or does not allow them to search or violate the Fourth Amendment. They have to do their job properly, and that's what this whole thing is about, forcing them to do their job properly. Number three would be consent. Just went over that for the most part. Because if consent is given by a person really believed by an officer to have authority to give consent, no warrant is required for a search and seizure. Your significant other cannot allow for them to search unless you authorize them or give them authority to do so. So consent is the easy one. Don't need a warrant if you consent to it. You have the variety of stop and frisk. Now understanding this one is one I've harped on a hundred times because this is used constantly without, it's, it's just, it, I cannot fathom the amount of times that I've hear these stories in places like New York, Chicago, Atlanta, where police just go up to Cab County and stop and frisk individuals just because. Now, here's the what makes it the exception because this is a Terry B. Ohio execution of this case. And that's why I've said it a hundred times, is understanding the and and if. Police may stop a suspect as long as there is reasonable suspicion of a criminal act and the officer can articulate facts leading to that suspicion. The evidence necessary for reasonable suspicion is something beyond mere suspicion, but is less than the level of probable cause. Now, the frisking is, or the pat down, if there is reason to believe that the person may be armed and dangerous, the police may frisk the suspect or the suspect gives them consent. Never consent. They have to articulate, make them do their job. They're going to say things like, oh, you're being uncooperative or you're being unreasonable. My thing is, why did you take an oath to be a fiduciary servant if you are not going to do that? What is the point? If I'm being cooperative, uncooperative for forcing you to do your job properly what was your point in getting the job so make them do their job make them do it properly now they call it the automobile exception here's what I love about this one because the simple fact that this is a Carol v United States 267 US 132 1925 case because even back then, they understood the importance of a rolling conveyance. Now, a warrant is not required to search vehicles if, poli if police have probable cause to believe the vehicle contains evidence of a crime, the instruments of a crime, contraband, or the fruits of a crime. The whole point of that is they must still be able to articulate it because even if they don't they have to understand or you have to understand the fact that even after the fact if they choose to do something without consent they have to be able to say hey I thought it contained something from the crime of you know a bank robbery or something they have to come up with an actual crime to search if not given consent at all times before, during, after. Whether it's to you or it's to a judge. Has to be brought up. And that's Carol V. U.S. If the police 
suspect the occupant of a boat is smuggling people across the border. Searching a small tackle box on board would not be permissible. However, if they are looking for drugs, they could search the tackle box. The rationale is that if the officer has to take time to obtain a warrant, the vehicle might be out of reach before the warrant can be issued and executed. So again, this is going to go into something that we're going to talk about just a touch next, and then we're going to go into those actual rules. And the last one, which I'm going to actually go deeper into detail in the next couple of videos, is emergencies, hot pursuit, or plainly stated exigent circumstances, because there are only a few. Now, we touched on it earlier. We're touching on it again. We're going to go into detail on that in just a little bit. But the rationale is similar to the automobile exception. Evidence can be easily moved, destroyed, or otherwise made to disappear before a warrant can be issued and executed. And that comes from Kentucky v. King, 563 U.S. 452, 2011. And basically the whole thing is to understand that exigent circumstances may or may not apply to you. And in most cases, it doesn't. So, most of these exceptions begin with a lawful reason for the officer to be there. And belief of a crime. If none of those are there, pat-downs are unnecessary. Searches are unnecessary. Articulation is 100% necessary. So, going through those six, we have search incident to a lawful arrest if it's not lawful there's no search plain view consent stop and frisk automobile exception and emergencies or exigent circumstances so understanding those are the exceptions to the warrant probable cause consent one or the other articulation they have to have a reason to be there if not no searches here. Until next time.